Hello there, and welcome to Ox Talks, the podcast powered by Oxleb, the local enterprise partnership for Oxfordshire and sponsored by leading national law firm Mills and Reeve. If you haven't tuned into Ox Talks before, we aim to air current issues in business and explore topics of interest with the help of some truly remarkable leaders in the county. I'm Howard Bentham, and throughout these podcasts, I'll be in conversation with some of the best people in their field, getting their advice and tips, which in turn may help you achieve your goals. Every one of my guests is keen to acknowledge the valuable support that's available from Oxlep and how it could be crucial in helping your company or organisation thrive. Our focus, as you would expect, is on Oxfordshire's businesses and issues in these podcasts, but naturally you may well be listening to us outside of the county. Many of the issues we experience here will be very similar to the ones that you're potentially facing where you are. Please join in the conversation and share any thoughts. Our social media is a great way to get in touch. We are at Oxfordshire LEP on X and Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership on LinkedIn. Why not raise a question for future discussions? Please use the email address in the podcast description. We look forward to hearing from you. This edition is entitled Top Tips for Starting a New Business feasible versus fantasy. We'll explore guidance and advice for starting a new business in 2024, including how to become a successful entrepreneur. The word entrepreneur conjures up many images in one's mind. In popular culture, the entrepreneur has a fascinating relationship with television audiences. From the aspiring business people seeking investment from Dragon's Den, the young upstarts currying favour with Lord Sugar in The Apprentice, to the hilarious character of Del Boy in the long-running comedy Only Fools and Horses. The path to success is a journey that genuinely enthralls us. But what marks out an entrepreneur? What are their qualities? How do they manage risk and cope with failure? Creating something from nothing and seeing a gap in the market. The word entrepreneur today truly sums up what it means to be proactive, innovative and passionate about business, ready to seize the opportunity. Our Ox Talks guest is the founder and former executive director of the Oxford Centre for Entrepreneurship Innovation at the University of Oxford and is now an associate professor for the MSc Bioscience Entrepreneurship Programme at University College London. In 2002, she founded the Oxford Entrepreneurs, which has since grown to be the largest entrepreneurship society in Europe, with 12,000 Oxford University members and more than 77,000 network members. I'm delighted to welcome to Ox Talks Fiona Reid. Fiona, welcome. Great to see you. I tried to paint a picture of an entrepreneur in the introduction. Define and describe what an entrepreneur looks like in your mind's eye. Well, I would say it looks everything that's not the stereotypes that you've just given me, because it's very a common narrative that um, entrepreneurs look like a certain type of person. They look like somebody off Dragon's Den or The Apprentice or some version of a Silicon Valley teenager in a T-shirt, etc. And in fact, those stereotypes are... Um, they only they're only for a small number of people only a small number of people actually look like that as entrepreneurs many entrepreneurs there come in all different shapes and sizes and it can sometimes be unhelpful because it uh, allows people to self select out of being an entrepreneur because they think they're not like the entrepreneurs they see on television so i think it's a sort of unhelpful um way of looking at entrepreneurship is is to look at these stereotypes and single them out so would you sort of sum up what one is then or uh, uh, literally that it's the broadest of, of all broad churches? OK, well, I think when we ask this question, I will I will go back to what the social science researchers say about this as well, which is actually quite different from the, the popular opinion of the stereotypical entrepreneur. Um, they do have a particular attitude towards risk. Often they're thought to be sort of risk takers. But in fact, actually, they're actually very good at calculating risk. So every move that's made, every strategic um, change is always calculated in terms of the downside. So what happens if this fails? So they're very good at calculating it every step of the way and recalculating that, that profile of risk. Um, they're often very anxious. I think that that's the, the social science will say that in, in spades. Um, then they're also always in pursuit of opportunity beyond what they currently control. So they are looking for 
um, new territory, new things to conquer that they don't necessarily have the resource for now. So their vision goes beyond where they are currently at the moment. And I think those are probably three quite common characteristics of entrepreneurs. Um, their personalities may be different um, underneath that. We'll explore that some more later. Let, let's have some of your experiences cutting it as an entrepreneur, if you like. W what were you doing exactly? Take us on a bit of a trip. Okay, so I've started two businesses. One's in precision engineering and the other one's a consultancy business and been involved with sort of dozens more as mentor and uh, non-executive director and sometimes investor and board member as well too. So it's been a mixture of... Um, a very, uh, very happy mixture, actually, between half working in business schools and helping others and half doing it for real in, in many different contexts. Uh, and are you still an entrepreneur? I mean, is, is that something you ever stop being? Well, once you've been there, that's that's it. You've, oh, you've, well, you've that's, taken the genie out of the bottle. Well, that's, that's, that's an interesting debate in itself, whether entrepreneurs are born or made or whether they just sort of arrive in with entrepreneurial characteristics or whether you can actually teach people to be entrepreneurs. And I, of course, because I work in universities, believe that you can teach people I'm how so to be entrepreneurs. I'm so glad you answered it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I think very much so in terms of I... To use an American expression, have a sort of growth mindset. If I'm doing something, I kind of want to make it bigger and larger and more successful. And I like to have that pedal pressed firmly down on Accelerate. And it's not always the wisest thing to do. And sometimes it comes at a cost. Um, but I think I just have that that mindset. If, if it's something that you're passionate about and really believe in, um, particularly when it involves partly working in an educational environment and, and new businesses are always, they're always growing. They start from somewhere and they, they have the opportunity to, to grow. I think I like that, that growth curve, um, helping others and also doing it myself. You founded Oxford Entrepreneurs and the Oxford Centre for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Probably worth explaining what they are, firstly. Okay, so about 20 years ago, when the new Oxford University Said Business School opened, um, a very small part of that was a very small entrepreneurship centre called the Science Enterprise Centre, which was myself and one other person um, attempting to introduce entrepreneurship across the Oxford University, uh, and particularly for scientists to train scientists to become better at the practical application, the innovation process arising from their ideas. And it was a new business school and in some ways was symbolic of Oxford University kind of opening its doors to, to businesses more and inviting small businesses to come in and network with the academics and others and just generally bringing people together. So that was part of the ethos and that came out with a strongly sort of entrepreneurial hat. And it was, I suppose, a question of being the right place at the right time and nice new building right next to the station and we we built out for, we built out from there and you know, I believe the university is a very entrepreneurial university I mean that's not exactly the adjective that many would use about it but it's it's full of ideas and full of very good people as indeed is also is Oxford Brooks as well so there's this big talent pool of academics and young students and researchers who are keen to know more about business, which is not something they do every day. So you, if you like, went to the university with this idea, we want to launch this. So it, it was from your, or did the university say you'd be great at launching Well, this? the university had a small amount of money um, from a particular government fund called the Science Enterprise Challenge, which it had to set up. I was actually already doing the same role at Imperial College. Um, and they said, come and be set up this, this centre in Oxford for us. And, yeah, so it was a wonderful opportunity to kind of create something new from the ground up in a department, the business school, which was itself a startup department. What did you learn about entrepreneurship and talent in Oxford? You're at the university, of course. Well, I think I, the first thing I learned was how many people were interested in the area and interested in learning more about business. Um, we had a... We had a program which we set up, which was called The Basics of Building a Business. And it was running in the evening once a week, 
for 10 weeks as a course. And we were inviting scientists from Brooks and also from Oxford University and some other local entrepreneurs. And it was so immediately successful. We had to create a separate lecture theatre as an overspill. And we had a waiting list instantaneously and hundreds of people turning up every night to have this this business education, which was good. It was free for delivery. Nobody was paid to teach it. Lots of business school academics did it um, for free. And so from there, lots of good connections were made. You know, businesses were started. Young people were kind of given perhaps the tools to think about how they could turn their ideas into reality. And many of them did. I'm intrigued the fact that people are prepared to give up their time and, and do that for other people's benefit in terms of their financial benefit. Yes, it, it wasn't It wasn't so much. I mean, there's part of being an entrepreneur, which is about making money. And then that's perhaps a, a, a part that is less attractive within the university environment. What is attractive is seeing their ideas out there in the world. Um, and for students, perhaps they're motivated sometimes to set up a business to actually make money for themselves. But it's not at the forefront of, um, as it is indeed with many entrepreneurs, it's a bit of a myth that people are in it primarily for the money. They're in it for all sorts of other reasons, but money is rarely at the forefront, actually. That is so, so interesting. Again, the, the stereotype we were yeah. talking about at the start. So what, so what other things are they in it for then? I, I guess if you're creative, you want to see your your idea come to fruition, but what else? I think as they want to maybe show something of themselves or to the world to really, they often really, really believe in what they're doing and they are just very motivated to see it work. And once it does start working, the growth in itself, I think people find exciting. Um, there's a very interesting link in the, in the research about the link with um, dyslexia. So lots of um, very successful entrepreneurs were dyslexic and often struggled at school in the traditional academic sense, but had accentuated qualities uh, in terms of being good leaders, um, good communicators, good delegators, um, able to to network and have often have got a lot of the very good personal communication and leadership skills for being an entrepreneur. Richard Branson, for example, is, is a thing. But many other people who perhaps didn't succeed in traditional academic senses are motivated to to build a successful company because what better way is there of showing your parents and teachers and everyone around you how great you are than building a fantastic successful company from scratch uh, it, genuinely fascinating that is uh, just, just coming back to to your story fiona if we can from oxford you went to london to teach at ucl we, we've mm -hmm. touched on that Tell us about your decision to move from the School of Management to the MSc Bioscience Entrepreneurship Program. It's a great title. I, you, I can tell from how you've been talking already, you're passionate about science. How does this link science and business? Well, yes, I've always been interested in that sort of science business interface and, and really working quite closely to the science as well. There's in many universities, there's this the formal technology transfer office, which is the the place that processes university-owned patents and turns them into sort of companies. And it's not quite that space that I'm really keen on. It's about teaching and using education as a tool for new venture creation and from the science base. So I think it's more about empowering scientists sometimes to make better, to be able to negotiate better with business and industry that comes and wants to work with them too because there's a slightly asymmetric power relationship there if you're a, if you're a scientist and you do your one thing and you're in negotiation with a very large multinational with ranks of expensive lawyers you know you're not necessarily going to be getting the best outcome for you and your science out of that and perhaps it's never occurred to you that it would be a good idea that you could actually take your ideas and run with them and, and build something for yourself. So it's really just about planting the seeds of the seeds, the tools, the language, the vocabulary, and giving a little bit of confidence for, for smart people to be able to speak a different language when they need to. Without taking us through the curriculum, but I, I've, I've just got the picture in my head here that <laughs> your lecture theatre full of uh, masters uh, doing their masters, if you like, and, and they've got all these great ideas. How, how do you get them to be good business people as well because 
just because you've got a great idea doesn't make you Einstein wasn't necessarily the greatest businessman ever, was he? So how do you make that happen? Yes. Well, at UCL, the master's course that I run, which I went, I left Oxford to, to, to go and set up because it's a very specialist curriculum degree, whereas a lot of the training perhaps is off curriculum. And, you know, doing a master's program is a chance to really sort of build the space. Um, scientists like and dislike a certain very sort of nuanced set of things and it depends really whether they're students or whether they're career researchers as well. So the career researchers uh, prefer the word innovation to entrepreneurship because they don't see themselves as being entrepreneurs and they kind of dissociate a little bit from that whole idea so you don't talk too much about entrepreneurship and Silicon Valley stereotypes. Um, the students that I teach are... are mostly almost all so have a science background and want to do something with science even if that doing is not clearly defined what it is they're going to do so we teach them we teach them about um marketing and communication which is the bit they like the least because it involves simplification <laughs> well and also probably it involves there isn't a straightforward answer it, yeah. it isn't black and it isn't white it's yeah. all very Yes. Different shades of all sorts of colours in between. Yeah. And scientists don't like that. No. And I think they find it quite painful sometimes <laughs> simplifying things to the point when it feels to them that it's actually wrong. So you give them, you know, you train them to do a sort of pitch statement or something or a 30 second pricey of what it is that they do and what they're planning to do. Um, and even if you practice with them, when they actually get to speak it out loud, they tend to look at their feet or, or just look away and somehow sort of try to divorce themselves from the situation they're in as well because it feels it sort of feels uncomfortable. Yeah, that, I, I, I can share your pain there. I, I do some media work with scientists as well, and, and sometimes it's about t a, a feel for something. Mm. And, and I guess making a decision to go into business and to make your idea work there's a, an element of feel for it mm. you're not basing it on data or no, anything exactly. absolutely concrete so that must be must make you very popular <laughs> <laughs> um, you often emphasize the importance of entrepreneurs dealing with uncertainty and problems what do you think is the biggest challenge that the entrepreneurs of today face particularly in oxford I think there are levels of uncertainty all around. I mean, we're living in sort of uncertain times. You know, the, the, the nature of the economy is changing quite quickly. We've got technology sort of splicing with science and business. And um, in some ways, there's, there's lots of areas where there's really no rule book. Um, and there's also no, in some cases, no regulation around spaces that are being innovated in where there is not sort of strong regulation too. So I think having a experimental mindset you know the the ability to iterate very quickly you know you have an idea you have a business model you have to be prepared to change that very quickly um based on based on failure based on um the risk uh, associated with going down a particular path um which if you take it and take it exclusively you may end up crashing your business too so i think i think there's a lot of uncertainty around around money and financing as well i mean it's a sort of huge area of of challenge for you know all small businesses as well as so when how can they make their financials feel safe enough to grow but focusing on the innovation ecosystem in these parts in oxford and mm -hmm. oxfordshire I, I mean you must be uh, on the edge of your seat it's an exciting place to be isn't it oh absolutely yes no it's a, it's a it's a fantastic place and it's uh you know the power of the ecosystem is is known but is probably there's even more that could be realised by untapping more potential for, I mean, we have these two great universities, 50,000 plus students a year, um, lots of ideas, um, a space where ideas are listened to as well. I think that's one of the features of both universities is the openness about ideas. What about the support systems that are out there for young innovators and wanting to start their own business or maybe find a business partner? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the challenge I'm sure that you're, you've uh, locally economic partnership is very well aware of this is all around is around space and that's that space for housing, space for people, and I think that space sort of sits behind some of the labour shortages that are seen in in the county, and are, are, you know they're a real struggle for many businesses as well. If you need to have specialist skills in some of the newer technologies, you're going to be hard pushed to find them locally. As the same is true, incidentally, in London as well. I mean, the UCL 
spin outs and startups as well have problems attracting people um, on the sorts of salaries they can afford. Mm. And I guess the danger is that you have the brain drain, to use the phrase, and, mm-hmm. and they'll head off to the States or wherever else. So yes. H- how do you counter that? Well, it's a bit of a problem sometimes. I mean, certainly the early days of, of Oxford entrepreneurs, um, there was, you know, really mass exodus to Silicon Valley, um, which I found very disappointing. I kept thinking, well, you should you should stay here. You know, it's a wonderful environment in which to innovate. But the, I think the access to venture capital was 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 very different. It's probably now less different 20 years later, but most of the early Oxford entrepreneurs who are Oxford students went and made you know some very considerable fortunes in Silicon Valley. What about some of the great ideas you, you're, you're seeing now, innovative approaches that are, have caught your attention recently? Uh, share, share a few uh, sort of things that are on the, the drawing board right now of people you're talking to. Well, I think I'm quite focused on a lot of the ideas that come out of where I sit in UCL at the moment, which is the Institute of um, Ophthalmology, which is uh, attached to Moorfields Eye Hospital as well. So everything to do with the eye. Um, And I like to say, you know, this is all about vision and vision is a very business word and a very entrepreneurship word as well. Um, The eye is the only organ of the body that you can see and you can actually see a lot of the body through the eye. And so the scientists there do everything from genetics, cell biology, imaging, public health, um, lots and lots of AI and Everything from very basic science right the way through to very applied science. So there's lots of very interesting stuff happening with with eyes and imaging and diagnosing your health through the eye. And, of course, that splices with the increases in digital health, uh, the, the ways in which we can access data and genetics and put it all together in something that looks like a sort of consumer health app but is actually providing quite substantial quantities of health care and we're trusting these things because they're in our phone. So that's a very interesting, it's an interesting space to be sitting in the middle of and listening to what's what's going on. You play it down quite nicely, if you don't mind me saying so. I, a lot, sure there are a lot of uh, other people might go, that is amazing. Do, do you ever have those, good Lord, that's incredible what they're doing there. Yes, I still do get very Good. excited about you know <laughs> about hearing yeah. about some of this as well, and and again you know I sometimes hear that from the scientists who are talking about it, and they're very low key about it, and really? they don't really they don't really sometimes know what what they what they're looking at themselves, the insights that they've made, and also the things that are adjacent technologies that could be put together with that to really create something that's that's very interesting and good. Let's bring in Oxleps Communications Manager, Rob Panting. Rob, good to uh, to talk to you. Of the people you support at Oxlep, are a good number of those entrepreneurs? Thanks, Howard. Yeah, a considerable number, in fact. Um, I think what we find quite often is those entrepreneurs are coming to us at different stages of their business journey. So we might have a number that come to us pre-startup stage, perhaps unsure as to what their journey might be look like and uh, Fiona touched on this uh, a little bit in her uh, opening uh, discussion around perhaps not having the sort of overall business acumen and they need support in that area to help make their venture become commercially viable so we get a lot of people coming to us at that early stage Um, but equally you know once an entrepreneur moves into sort of uh, full flight as it were the ongoing sustainability of that business and the um uh, we've mentioned it in, in in previous podcast episodes the the peer support that might be needed that's that's quite significant for those entrepreneurs um again we've touched on this just just a moment ago oxfordshire is a is a great place for entrepreneurs we probably very biased in saying that in terms of the organizations that we've that we represent or have represented but there is great ideas in Oxfordshire and um, in many ways that makes our life a lot easier because it's about harnessing those great ideas and creating the the space and opportunity for those ideas and those entrepreneurs to to flourish there's always been entrepreneurs in in Oxford and Oxfordshire um, and, and I think our role is 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 trying to ensure that the the sustainability of those organisations remains strong. 
Fiona, you're scribbling away there. You got ideas? <laughs> as Rob's talking, obviously the thoughts are coming into your mind. <laughs> Share them with us, with us. No, absolutely. I was just saying one of the one of the reasons why Oxfordshire is so so good at supporting entrepreneurs is that there is it is quite well networked, um, and in some ways it's better networked than some of the much larger cities because, like Cambridge, it's all fairly sort of. It, there's a sort of dense population of entrepreneurs in one place um, and lots of opportunities for peer support. And that's, again, something we know from the research is that entrepreneurs learn very strongly from each other. And, you know, small business owners do as well. They, they pick up so much um, from being in a place where they can listen to others. So all those opportunities are a really important part of the small business growth if you want to put it generally, um, in in the in the county, Rob, is it fair to say that you see more entrepreneurs, should we say, breaking the shackles since the pandemic? The world has changed shape. As I'm going to seize the moment, I think so. We we've we've seen um, a, a significant number of people come forward, perhaps approaching their um, approaching their approach to work very differently now. So, whereas in the past, I think many were very happy to be part of perhaps a, a, a bigger wheel as such and be a cog within that wheel, generating ideas. Um, I think a lot more. People now are feeling sort of bolder and they feel impassioned to go away and actually put their ideas into into practice and try and turn them into a business. Like Fiona says, I think entrepreneurs have that their ideas people and maybe the pandemic perhaps reassessed and realigned a lot of people's thoughts and thinking. As we mentioned earlier, Oxfordshire has never struggled with with entrepreneurs. We've got two great universities. Um, we've got a great, in particular, science and innovation, a great community with the likes of Harwell, Milton Park, um, Oxford Science Park, etc. You know, lots of great areas for people to to develop great ideas within great companies. But I think a lot more people are perhaps feeling uh, ready to. Um, to put their own ideas into their own practice, and uh, and if we can harness those ideas and give them support that that they need, then Oxford are doing a great job um, through that. Fiona, what's your advice then for an entrepreneur? R- Rob's sort of talked about the situation that uh, they're they're struggling to evaluate an opportunity. You see ideas people every day of the week here. Yeah. How do you get them to decide what is worth the investment and time and what clearly is not. Well, just getting back to what Robert mentioned about about perhaps what is we're seeing more of, which I very much agree, post pandemic is a more sort of values led startup approach. Um, and you talk to certainly sort of younger people and students and researchers, and they said they they want to have a sort of purpose behind their work, and and that's becoming more and more important. And I know that's very more important more generally in the workplace. Um, so that's almost like a starting point. So that the whatever the business you want to set up needs to fulfil something of your purpose and include something of your values. And in fact, it's actually quite a sort of good way of expressing your values in the workplace is by doing something uh, for your for yourself. Um, and in terms of evaluating a business, I think, you know, a, a very hard hat of realism is a very good thing to, to have on your, uh, whether actually something is going to be feasible. And for that, really, you need to have quite good skills in prediction and planning and, and costing and a, quite a lot of really quite sort of boring detail about is this actually going to work or am I going to be able to get the people to do it I'm going to find space how much does it cost so that whole mapping out of a little bit of mapping out enough to know whether you can actually make the bare bones of it work um, is 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 a useful sort of first step of stress testing your idea mm. Heartbreak or not, it's, it's what it, it comes yeah. to, doesn't it? Uh, Rob, give us an idea then, Rob, about the very, very clear support that Oxlep can offer here. I've got an idea. I'm not quite sure how to make this fly. Yeah, most most of our support tends to be around trying to ensure that entrepreneurs feel uh, ready to go into uh, the world of business. So most of our support looks at things like communications and marketing, uh, finance, those key aspects to support businesses run day to day um that's the vast majority of requests that that come our way from from entrepreneurs um 
going back to the peer network elements as well that there's big demand for that with the, the clients that we support uh, and learning from uh, not only uh, like-minded entrepreneurs, but people from across different sectors, how they've perhaps responded to a particular challenge or a particular opportunity. Um, and our ability to perhaps convene people is is one of our biggest strengths. And um, that's something that we're constantly trying to uh, ensure works really well for, for our business community and particular entrepreneurs who, who might be coming at, um, coming at things, you know, very uh, embryonically uh, and offering that support is, is something that is in big demand. Setting goals, Fiona, is an important part of, of starting a business for sure, isn't it? So, is it a case of sometimes managing expectations of the, the people you're working with to decide what's feasible and what's fantasy? I think it's quite difficult to have a homogenous set of rules for testing the feasibility of a new business startup because there's a really huge difference between setting up a new retail business and setting up um, a new venture which is trying to make a new bioscience therapeutic and a new drug. And the at every point from the idea onwards, everything is different. So in the bioscience case, uh, extreme example, you are going to be having to raise money and you're going to have to raise money at the start, be it from grants to begin with or various types of soft financing. The government de-risks a, a lot of early stage startups. So you're in the business of managing investors from the start. Whereas if you are uh, setting up a business where the barriers to entry are lower, you can grow organically. You can take it more at the pace that you want to. Um, the priorities are different. The parameters are different. The risk feels different as well. So I, I think, you know, the, the most important rule is that there are really no rules. Um, and entrepreneurs some, tend to sometimes pick up and, and roll with that quite successfully is to say, well, I, I'm just going to do things that work best for my particular company in this particular setting, dealing with these particular customers. And I'm going to slightly make up the rules as, as I go along too. So I think, you know, feasibility is a difficult one. Um, I quite often say to new entrepreneurs or new teams that that doesn't sound very feasible and it doesn't sound like a good idea and I'm very very often proved completely wrong so I think sometimes the nature of our advice needs to be quite targeted towards the particular business yeah and that makes your job quite difficult for a start if you have to hold your hand it does say, yes Actually, yes yeah yeah I didn't you, see that coming you get routinely ignored and, and routinely sort of look at things and think I've now learned never to say crazy actually I've now learned that <laughs> things that sound crazy turn into real businesses three years later so I very much and all my colleagues who do the same sort of work um, would agree with that too yeah I, I guess timing is when you've got this great idea timing is everything isn't yeah it? no that's absolutely right I think that's the critical quality and I'd add that to my list of of critical qualities of, of entrepreneurs is they have a very good sense of timing they know when to go to the market when to raise money um, when to hire another person um, and just have a sort of almost a sixth sense of what is going what what timing is going to work well for their business and particularly you know going into the market as well you know the, the point at which maybe the first two or three businesses doing something very new have set up already and, and the timing is now perfect to do it really, really well. What about luck uh, and serendipity? Does, does that play a part? Well, it plays a lot, it plays a big part in the stories that we hear about it, doesn't mm, it? You know, the, the narratives the, around yeah. it, you know, I just bumped into that's this guy the in the question, lift yeah, and I was yeah. chatting away to him and I had a business plan on my, and an envelope in my pocket and suddenly I was funded. So it's, luck does play a part in really, I think everyone's career path to some extent. Um, and entrepreneurs often talk about the chance meeting, you know, the meeting at a, at a conference or a networking session. They met somebody who gave them the, the essential pearl of wisdom that helped them very much with their particular business. Um, but I, I think entrepreneurs are pretty good at calculating what they need to do. And because they're working with stretched resources all the time, they, they manage risks quite carefully. I don't think they leave that much to chance. Yeah, the famous golfer, Gary Player, back in the day, always said, uh, yeah, <laughs> the more I practice, the luckier I get. It's, uh, <laughs> I think there's, there's possibly a lesson in, in there, yes, too. Yes, yes. Um, give, give us a, 
a, a story, an example of a successful startup that you've, you've come across recently? Inspire everyone with a, with a tale. Hmm. What's the best example I can can think of, actually? I'm going to use one from a little while ago, actually, which is one of the original Oxford entrepreneurs who he was actually studying medieval history. He was doing a master's in medieval history, and he um, got together with a PhD student who was studying the mathematics of war. And what they turned up creating together, you know, after a long period of time and quite a lot of experimental error and failure, you know, university is a good place to fail your businesses. It's, uh, it's better than doing it for real and putting all your money into it. Um, and they came up with a business which was based on data analytics. And so they now run a very successful company called Quid in San Francisco. And the the idea, they think it's they thought that the merging of their two academic disciplines was was extremely sensible because medieval history is all about um, picking up small bits of evidence from a long period of time and trying to make sense of it. And the mathematics of war equally is uh, a strategic picture. And putting those two disciplines together, they were able to work out how to how to do data analytics in a, in a very sophisticated way very early. So I think that was a sort of a useful, a successful startup story emerging from a chance encounter at the university, even though it ended up in Silicon Valley and not in Oxfordshire, which it could have done. Not so many people knocking your door down with the mathematics of war, Rob, I'd imagine, <laughs> at Oxlip. Sadly not. Fascinating. Howard, it? That's yeah. another podcast on itself, isn't it? <laughs> but what about some local examples of uh, of some, some great stories that have, ideas that have turned into big things? Yeah, picking up a strand actually that Fiona mentioned earlier, probably around social entrepreneurship, which I think is, um, this is anecdotal really, but uh, I think I've seen emerge quite a lot within Oxford and Oxfordshire over the past um, decade or so. Um, Fiona made a good point earlier on around how entrepreneurs, particularly in Oxfordshire, try to put a purpose behind their entrepreneurship. A couple of really good examples, which, um, you know, they will likely be familiar with a lot of people, uh, a company called Oxwash uh, that you see quite often in, a, in and around the city centre, which is essentially uh, a, a extremely sustainable laundry service, I think created by, um, also by two uh, Oxford graduates. I, I may be incorrect on that, but um, we've supported Oxwash a little bit with their initial stages and, and the growth of the company's been phenomenal but at the heart of it is sustainability and how um how laundry can be um you know better for the environment or trying to make laundry better laundry servicing better for the environment and um the company is there very much for that purpose the products that they use are, are, are highly sustainable products and um they've created a you know, a fully fledged business off the back of that. Uh, another really good example, again, around social, uh, social entrepreneurship is an organisation called Tap Social, who we may or may not feature in future Ox Talks episodes. Um, but Tap Social have, I think, created a uh, an organisation that is 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 not only not only has entrepreneurship at the centre of it, but it also looks to reinvest in people so the purpose behind pap social is it's a it's a brewery it's a um it, but it's a company that very much has reintegrating people who um you know may have served time in prison found themselves in difficulties within that particular workplace um so I, I think we've got a lot to be proud of in in oxfordshire around i think giving people opportunities and putting a social element, um, a community element at the front of our entrepreneurship. And that's another strand really, which I think probably we at Oxlet would like to do a little bit more of is working with those perhaps more isolated communities in, in Oxfordshire. You know, we've got a fantastic city in Oxford and, and one where we've got the most highly educated people in the world based here. Um, but there are communities in Oxfordshire not so well off, and but the creativity exists there, and perhaps making sure that pathways are available to those entrepreneurs within perhaps more isolated and diverse communities is something that, that we're very keen to try and 
push forward and i think probably collectively in oxfordshire that's that's the case as well it's it, that's a big area of work that probably needs to be uh, investigated a little bit more fiona by contrast when someone fails we've, we've heard some great success stories there but when someone fails to make a business work do we judge that too harshly in this country in the states for example it's just part of the learning curve isn't it mm. but here you, viewed as a, f a failure is that a fair comment Yes, I think that's that's true, and it's often cited as the reason why the Americans are are thought to be more entrepreneurial than the British and and many European countries actually as well as they have a different attitude towards towards failure, and it is seen as a badge of honour. And in fact, you know, some it is the case that actually many venture capitalists will prefer if you've tried and failed at a couple of businesses, um, and that really is that really is the case over there too. So the the whole attitude. The, the sort of shame factor about failing in a business as well. I mean, I think it's not just social pressure. It's also the, the financial consequences of failure are are more harshly ex executed over here than they are in, in the States. In terms of bankruptcy. Yes, and yeah. a, a, just our, our rules as well as our sort of social systems don't make it that easy for... Um, it, it adds to the fear about starting up a company. It's not necessarily that helpful. Interesting. Fiona and Rob, thank you both for the moment. We'll chat again shortly. You're listening to Ox Talks, the podcast powered by the Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership and sponsored by leading national law firm Mills and Reeve. Please get in touch with the team at Oxlep to comment on what you've been hearing. Find us on social media. We're on X at Oxfordshire Lep or via LinkedIn. Search for Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership. Perhaps you run a company or organisation that's looking for some specific help or simply need a steer to the most appropriate business advice available. Why not try the Oxlep Business Support Tool? Oxlep's Business Support Tool is here to help your company. Whether you're just starting out, growing or ready to take on a new business challenge, if you're looking for the latest advice and support, complete our Business Support Tool today and get set to receive a bespoke action plan for your organisation. Head to oxlepbusiness.co.uk to find out more. Are you looking for high-quality, tailored legal advice in Oxfordshire? At Mills & Reeve, we're passionate about supporting the community and strive to keep local work local through our expertise, contacts and international network from our Oxford office. Our experience is vast, spanning areas such as commercial, corporate law, finance, ESG, employment, family, private client and planning. We can achieve more together. To find out how we can help you, get in touch at www.mills-reeve.com. Let's chat more to Fiona Reid, Associate Professor for the MSc Bioscience Entrepreneurship Programme at UCL. Fiona, you've said uh, in a previous interview that masculine stereotype figures like, and I'm quoting you here, the man in a T-shirt with a laptop who's going to take over the world are becoming the dominant image of an entrepreneur. Do you think any aspirational stereotypes of female entrepreneurs now exist? I think they're much less prominent. And... Many of the uh, male stereotypes are imported directly from Silicon Valley, where the you know the Bill Gates originally uh, have set the set, set the set the mode for what an entrepreneur should look like. And indeed, you know, in this country, it used to be that Richard Branson was the most famous you know, entrepreneur, and everyone thought that the uh, they ascribed characteristics to the entrepreneur, which are sort of pirate-like, going out onto the seas, the buccaneer. And, and this is an established type in social science research of, of the pirate entrepreneur. And in America, it's the equivalent is sort of the cowboy going out into the Wild West, conquering new lands and so forth too. So this sort of taps into an idea of how uh, a particular culture is and sometimes a particular country is as well. It's it's a great shame to me that there are there are fewer star female entrepreneurs. Um, I do think um, that the, the star female entrepreneurs there are, are don't perhaps court the celebrity in, in the ways that the, the very famous tech entrepreneurs have, have done. Um, they sort of get on and run their businesses really effectively. And as, as with many of our business leaders, they're not necessarily pushing themselves forward to be seen in quite the same type of way too. 
Um, Why do you think that's a deliberate thing, or do you think that's the is that basically because the person doesn't want to be seen, or because the media is not interested in promoting that? Well, I'll go back to the the figures on female founded businesses. So this is data from the British Venture Capital Association, which is pretty good data, um, showing that the number of female founder led businesses is below takes about less than 10% of all the venture capital in the UK. Um, and uh, that's true for teams that have got a woman on the founding team, as well as the, the ones that are uh, female led. So something is going on there. Um, and I don't think there's a really very clear picture about whether fewer women are putting themselves forward to become an entrepreneurs in the first place, or whether they are not asking for enough money, or whether they are not wanting to ask for money in the first place to begin with, because they generally are less successful and uh, get less venture capital to start with too. So I think the stereotypes have got a really important role to play there, because Perhaps, you know, it's a huge generalization. Women are not identifying strongly with some of the characteristics they see in the sort of Silicon Valley stereotypes um, and not wanting to put them, not wanting to be like that, being a different type, wanting to be a different type of perhaps more authentic purpose led leader of their business. Um, but it is, it is, I think over the time I've been working with entrepreneurs, I've seen fewer, I see fewer and fewer females coming forward, except in the areas of femtech, female technologies, where, where things are both the venture capital and also the number of entrepreneurs is really, really expanding a lot and very fast. So it's almost as if women are allowed to run femtech businesses because that's exclusively female and that's kind of the, a territory that they're allowed to do. Um, whereas in perhaps more traditional entrepreneurial settings, we have, you know, there are problems with fit. And I don't really know what the, the reasons behind that, except for they're disappointing. Is a part of the issue, if you rewind from what you were talking about there, back in the educational institutions themselves. Could they be better supporting female entrepreneurs? Is it, it is the case, if you can't see it, you, you'll never be it. But if it's not being sort of pushed in schools, and somebody's got the tendencies we've talked about here to be an entrepreneur, then you, you're not going to follow that through. Yes, I mean, I, I think there's a there's a huge role for education. I suppose I would do because I work in entrepreneurship education, <laughs> but um, an entrepreneurship education going right the way through schools. And some some schools have really um, centered on enterprise training and, and, you know, using the creativity and imagination about thinking about ideas and running competitions. And, and that's been very, very successful because you it can pick up sometimes just referring to what Rob was talking about, people who are perhaps less academically successful, but they're very good leaders, you know, and they can sometimes be difficult, you know, uh, p difficult students in the classroom sometimes because they're always thinking in a, in a slightly different way. Um, and it can, you know, enterprise and entrepreneurship can often pick up people like that and, and give them enough skills to think about different pathways that they can take. I like this word enough, you know, you don't need to know everything about finance and marketing and communications, you just need to know enough that you can start having those conversations. And and I think you touched on dyslexic um, pupils earlier, uh, and I, I guess on a spectrum of autism and, mm. and Asperger's as well, where the thought processes are quite clearly different, but maybe schools, colleges, universities are not picking up on that difference and augmenting it and giving it a chance to fly. Mm. And I, 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 yeah, I think it's, 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 a, it's an interesting one because I mean, it, business has never really had a place on the, on the UK curriculum, which perhaps is an issue. And we tend to teach and until quite recently in universities as well, enterprise entrepreneurship were taught off curriculum. So my first work at Oxford in the business school, most of the entrepreneurship education was off curriculum sort of open to many types of people and that actually worked quite well but without the formality and of being a piece of a, a, an educational topic that you have on the curriculum it's difficult to carve out enough time for people to to really experience it so you tend to get in university settings the people who self-select to come to those types of courses and find out about enterprise be involved in the competitions which is not a bad thing but it would definitely be good to have it more established on both school and university curriculums. Um, I mean, it's the engine of economic growth. You know, the the people like that. If you give them enough skills to to start thinking about creating businesses, they will go on and do a number of great things. 
anything you can add to that, Rob? And and it, it, just it, with the the sort of educational side of things, um, the, with, with Oxlep support, particularly around apprenticeships and mm. and getting uh, young people into that world of work. Yeah, we, uh, th there's a number of strands to, to to our work which which support that. Um, Probably one of the interesting areas is uh, our work alongside the careers of enterprise company and trying to create um, a, a knowledge for young people within Oxfordshire to understand um, not only what businesses are located here, but in terms of the entrepreneur side, give them an idea of the ecosystem that exists in Oxfordshire, um, very much sort of following on from what we were saying earlier around understanding your who your peers might be um sort of once you get into the world of work um the work with careers enterprise company in particular the, the teacher encounters program that we run we work with some of the the leading businesses in the county to um to ensure that the teachers in uh, in our schools in oxfordshire are very much aware of what career pathways might look like for young people and educating young people to understand what they are and the businesses that are located here we've said already the the key science and, and innovation that exists within oxfordshire how we are genuine world leaders in areas like uh, fusion um other energy fields cryogenics you know really quite significant um uh sectors of industries so yeah a big part of our work is is, is opening the eyes for the entrepreneurs of tomorrow, really. And, um, you know, we, we get great support from a lot of businesses in Oxfordshire to make sure that, that we're able to do that. I think you'd, you'd add to what it, uh, Rob's just said. You know, it's, it's very good to hear that there is there is this, this reach into schools um, to, to give people at least the experience of what the world of work looks like and also how companies start and, and how they can grow too. So it's, 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 good, it's good to hear that that's the case. Let's talk about money. You've mentioned venture capital uh, a, a fair part in the in the conversation, but sitting down, I've got an idea. It's very difficult to sit down and impress a whole bunch of venture capitalists that they're they're going to back your idea. What do you talk, tell your master's students uh, and and others about getting their hands on some money for for startups or just to make that next step in their business? Well, I tell them for as long as they can just to try and survive off free money. Um, and there are sources of free money there, like which, which, advice, I must admit. <laughs> which are, you know, <laughs> grants to do yeah. certain types of things. And uh, there are lots of organisations. We're lucky in the UK to have some quite chunky bits of finance that are available to to experiment with, um, to spend money on research and development of, of various types as well that don't involve having to go out to investors and selling half your company. I mean, venture capital basically starts at half a million pounds. It's 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 a fairly sizable amount of money to be going for. Everyone always thinks that's the first step. Um, a more more usual first step is the friends, family and fools of, of people who give you small amounts of money to get going to experiment, to start validating your idea. The process of validation adds value to your business, whereby you can then go to a, perhaps a, a financial provider, a bank or other forms of, of of debt and say, well, I need this amount of money in order to become successful in the, in the future. So it's not always just, it's again, it's the dragon's den effect is that everyone thinks that you've got to do this big shouty performance to a bunch of slightly aggressive people who are sitting there and asking you about, have you done your homework? Um, and it's not really like that in, in practice. You know, you'd have a much more sober business case presented to probably a much more sober bank manager to say, this is, this is what I want to do. And, can I have the capital to to get going? And it's not a shouty meeting. Uh, with, if I come to you, uh, Oxlep, Robert, and say, well, <laughs> find me some funding. I personally never shout, Howard. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think. Uh, I, I mean, to be under no illusion, I think the the um, the, the type of grant funding that Oxlep perhaps offered um, certainly immediately after the pandemic outbreak. That, that type of grant funding, unfortunately, we don't necessarily uh, facilitate to that that degree. Um, but as, as Fiona rightly says, there are other avenues available to uh, to entrepreneurs, to those who are sort of beginning their their business journey. Um, 
I know a couple of um, couple of organisations that, that that I've worked with who have used, for example, the Prince's Trust as as, a, as an option to secure some some initial grant funding, which I, th- I think is for eighteen to thirty year olds. So so very much um, your sort of entrepreneur. I know once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur. But as they're starting out as an entrepreneur, that early stage. Um, 18 to 30 year olds that's that's quite sort of fruitful ground to 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 go to organizations like the prince's trust and it's not just obviously financial backing there again it's it's a suite of um uh, business support opportunities um i mean we, we we would always um sort of try and provide a variety of support via oxvep um but there are there, there are lots of um lots of avenues to go if they go down if uh, entrepreneurs are looking for for funding I like your idea of free money best. Yeah, Large chunks of free money. <laughs> There's the marketing <laughs> campaign already. Um, let's pick up a couple of uh, questions from our social channels. Um, Rob, given the cost, of, uh, the cost of living crisis and people's finances being stretched in all areas of life, will this ultimately lead to fewer people embracing risk and take a safer option versus entrepreneurship? I think the answer is probably I and many others hope not. I think we're a poorer place without entrepreneurs. I think we we in Oxfordshire perhaps know more than most that great entrepreneurship can bring solutions to lots of problems. And we're, we're very lucky in Oxfordshire that there's an ecosystem in place to, I think, support people to bring their ideas to to fruition, whether that's in a creative industry, whether that's in the science industry. Um, we, we, we've worked hard to create, and, and Fiona more than most, to create uh, a, a, an ecosystem that supports entrepreneurs in Oxfordshire. I, I would be saddened to see that, um, you know, fall back. I guess the the reality is that the, the current economic climate might, move people away from that and it's safer to perhaps ensure that you've got your sure. your salary coming in at the end of each month but let's hope that that the entrepreneurship does continue fiona are you seeing that on the coal face that people are going this is not a good time i think a little bit in amongst the, the student population as well of, of they're thinking well actually i know i would like to start something myself but it's going to be a few years after I paid off my student loan. So I think that sits there as, as, as a shadow. I don't think that necessarily means that people are going into safe, comfortable careers, but I think it's just, well, we're riding out a particular wave of economic instability and then I will do something later. I think sometimes it takes years and years for people to um, to actually sort of plant that seed and get going so some of they always have it in them but it just the time as you say you know the timing has to be right for the individual uh and their personal circumstances and their setting and to some extent the state of the market access to finance you know lots of things have to kind of come together at the right stage but you know then also the research also would say that it's starting a business in a recession is a very good time to start a business because you have to be you know you have to be pretty ruthlessly efficient you have to make sure that you you stress test everything before you actually do it. You uh, fail things fast, and you know it's a tough climate. And the, the the nature of the challenge means that you you're problem solving perhaps faster than when it's really easy. Lots of entrepreneurs think it's a, a problem if they have raised too much money. I once had a panel coming into the business school, and there was like. 10, 11, 12 entrepreneurs and I'd given them all questions, you know, what's you been what was your biggest problem when you were setting up? And many of them got financed in the early internet dot com booms, two thousands onwards. And they said one of the problems they had was having too much money. Too much investment. So the pressure from investors to do certain things and take certain directions was was hard. And it was not the it was not the appropriate rate of organic growth that they would have wanted had they had their time again and in fact you know the 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 organic growth that doesn't have lots of venture capitalists and investors is a path that's taken by a lot of high growth entrepreneurs that is genuinely fascinating you can have too much money Yes, it sounds strange, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. it's, it's not, you know, your own money. It, it's no, no, money it, that comes into else's your... money uh, makes it even harder. Yeah, right? and, and you're, you're, you're dancing to the tune of a bunch of people who want to see return very quickly on their investments. And that's a big problem with some of the science and tech-based businesses is that you you might 
you know, there might be a, a problem with the technology, it might not work, you might have to sort of pivot and do something else. And investors are impatient in this country, you know, they are, they are less patient than in America. Uh, another question from our socials. Uh, uh, Rob, I th I'd be amazed if you don't answer this one positively. Is Oxfordshire a good place to be if you're an entrepreneur? I mean, I think we've, covered, we've no, covered that. Uh, to, uh, yeah, uh, we're yeah. Off. <laughs> working for the wrong company, if I did say no. Um, no, I mean, we've touched on it in dispatches earlier on. I, I, Oxfordshire is a, is a good place to be an entrepreneur. Um, I, I think... As I say, one area which I think we would be very keen to just try and perhaps make 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 more inroads is those communities, those less less affluent communities in Oxfordshire that you know the, the great ideas exist, and you know people are just looking for the opportunity and the um, uh, the, the ability to to move their uh, their idea to something a bit more commercialised. Um, that's an area we're quite keen to to get into. I think you know the, the 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 city and the universities they've got sort of good established networks that can be uh, can can be used uh, can be used well. I think we we just want to reach out to those uh, um, sort of more isolated communities and support those entrepreneurs. Yeah, no, I would I would agree with that. I think I think there's I think there are as many people who want to be what we might broadly call social entrepreneurs the next oxwashes and others as there are who pe people who want to make money and cover themselves in financial glory um you know social entrepreneurs uh, entrepreneurship is really difficult uh because you're answering not just the sort of financial performance measures but also to social performance measures and we haven't really got a good way to measure you know how you're making a social and impact. your conscience I guess, and your as conscience well. and and much other stuff yeah. besides it's a problem to, to scale it's a problem to make those financially efficient too so the social entrepreneurs are you know some of the most phenomenal people i work with i mean they are really amazing because they can do they they, they have just expanded the whole the whole toolkit the knowledge and mindset needed to become a successful entrepreneur they have included lots of other things as well and so they're they're pretty amazing and it's good to hear that Oxlep is looking to support those because their path is harder and it's particularly harder to make really big let's bring our conversation to a close with some final thoughts Fiona can you share any valuable tips nice punchy tips and experiences that could help startups looking to grow if you're going to give them a little checklist what would be on it mm. practice delegation lots of high growth entrepreneurs um, become very deeply and personally involved in their company and they can't let go they can't let go any set of responsibility because they feel that somebody else is not going to do it as well as they are so they end up with a you know 500 people all running around a little bit like headless chickens. And it's, it's a well-known documented stage of development of, of high growth individuals as the leader doesn't want to, to let go. So, you know, delegate as, delegate as much as possible at all times. You know, who, who else could do this? Who else could I bring in to do that task? And you don't need to be opening the envelopes, you know, in year five of growth. <laughs> <laughs> what a great tip. Um, Let's try and then sort of distill down those qualities that mark out an entrepreneur, the, the top three qualities in your view. I think a very good sense of, of timing of what to do when. Uh, an intelligent attitude towards, towards risk uh, and calculations that sit beneath that. And there's probably something of the the dreamer in there as well, the ability to latch onto something which doesn't exist and may sound fanciful to almost everyone you talk to um, and to be able to hold on to that potential for that to become reality. Um, it sounds a bit sort of fluffy to say that, but there is there is something of that in most of the successful entrepreneurs I, I see. There's something of the dream that's there. And that dream can sometimes be, I want to employ lots of people in my the community where I, where I grew up. I want to have 500 people. I want to be that sort of organisational pillar of the community too. So, But it's just, it's just seeing that dream out there and, and making steps towards it is really important. And what would be your main piece of advice for someone wanting to start a business in 2024? Gosh, is it possible to make one piece of, uh, one piece of advice? Um, 
It's not Desert Island Disc, so you can have as many uh, as you like, really. I would say get on top of the technology. Get on top of what technology can can do for you, what you can effectively outsource to technology to have within your business the skills that will be able to use it intelligently for the future. I think that's a very important sort of bedrock for, for growth to, to, have, ha, to have that sort of uh, future-proofing by having the technology awareness in your company. Fiona, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts Thank you so much. It's been a great joy. Thank you. Huge thanks to Fiona Reid, Associate Professor for the MSc Bioscience Entrepreneurship Programme at University College London. A big thank you also to Oxlips, Rob Panting as well. And thank you for listening to Ox Talks, sponsored by leading national law firm Mills and Reeve. There are now a number of editions of Ox Talks available from where you normally get your podcasts. Check out some of the previous editions featuring Tim Bestwick from the UK Atomic Energy Authority discussing Oxfordshire's place on the global technology stage. The CEO at Blenheim Palace, Dominic Hare, on the vital role of the visitor economy. And Emma Gibson, senior partner at KPMG Law, on the importance of SMEs. Every episode is well worth a listen. Please spread the word, tell your friends or colleagues about us. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. You can share your thoughts and suggestions on our social channels and you can email your questions for inclusion in future editions too. The address is in the podcast description. We'd love to hear your contributions. Remember, business support in Oxfordshire is very close at hand. The Oxlep Business Support Tool can signpost you to expert help in just minutes. Why not take a look? Find it on our website, oxfordshirelep.com. But for now, from the whole Oxlep team and from me, Howard Bentham, it's goodbye.